talking about this uh, before lunch. You know, you built these big platforms, and then, you know, there was this huge effort, and then, you know, you'd look at your data, and then... <laughs> now it's like continuous development process. You build, you adapt, you build, you adapt, and you really let the data help you understand, you know, what it is that we have to build, depending on what questions that um, we want to ask. So, um, listen, welcome. Thank you we're, so much. We're, we're grateful that you're here in our tools and tech, and we're very anxious to hear you talk about outcome modeling and radiotherapy and oncology, listening to the data. And anybody, my mom's got cancer, and she does radiotherapy, and, you know, this becomes personal, and it will at some point in your life. So take a take of that. Okay. okay, good. Can you introduce your background? Oh, no, I'm, usually we don't do that here, but, you know. Marcy. Marcy. <laughs> I, I usually just say he's from the Department of Radiation Oncology. Yeah, generally. That's kind enough. Exactly that's, don't. That's kind of enough. But, you know, it's, maybe we should change that. <laughs> well, uh, we thank you. Thank you very much. Th thank you very much, uh, Brian, for the kind introduction. Thank you very much, Marcy, for the invitation. And thank you, everybody, for uh, uh, being here. It's a great privilege just to have the opportunity to talk to you uh, this afternoon. So um, I'll be talking about outcome modeling and radiotherapy. I'm going to give a little bit of introduction uh, into uh, radiotherapy, so we have all the same uh, uh, reference here, although many of the techniques in outcome modeling could be also uh, leapfrogged into uh, oncology uh, as well. And as Brian uh, eloquently said, it's, it's all about uh, the data here and what we do with this uh, type of data. So radiotherapy is actually a trinity. It's a combination of physics, uh, biology, and engineering. It, uh, it actually uh, encompasses all uh, three components. It's based on using um, particles, um, photons or uh, X-ray type uh, part uh, particles, heavy, uh, high energy particles. It interacts with t tissue, that's the biology part. And the systems are built with uh, type of different type kind of engineering. So this is one example of that. This is a linear accelerator. This is the treat, uh, treating team. And this is where the radiation comes uh, from So in this uh, direction. And this device actually rotate around the patient generating uh, x-ray that is intended to cure uh, uh, the patient. So radiotherapy is a targeted uh, localized uh, treatment using uh, ablative high energy in the megavolt range. The intent is, of course, uh, to kill cancer, but like any other treatment, it also has its own uh, side effects. More than half all cancer patients receive radiotherapy as part of their treatment, whether it is uh, the major treatment modality or it's used as a, a adjuvant or assistant type uh, treatment. The radiotherapy tra treatment planning process go through multiple stages, which is primarily imaging based. So start by taking uh, computed uh, tomography scans, CT scans. Physician use these scans in order to outline the tumor and also the important normal structures that they would like to avoid. So there is a targeting and there is avoidance in the problem itself. Then there is some, it goes into a detailed uh, treatment radiation simulation to know where that radiation uh, dose is actually going. Then the treatment is being delivered either externally, which is what I'm going to focus on using linear accelerators, or uh, internally using brachytherapy. These are radioisotopes from the days of uh, Madame Curie and her husband. <laughs> so this is the radiotherapy process. So it starts by the CT scanning, um, as shown in this uh, example. This is a typical CT scan for the case of prostate cancer. So this is the target in this case, the prostate, and what we are trying to avoid is the bladder and uh, the rectum. So we'd like to focus the radiation here. The physicians go uh, into details to make sure that the radiation is going to the right place. This is actually a tattooing process to make sure the way we position the patient on the CT scanner is what we're going to do at the day of delivery. This is where the treatment planning takes place. This is the direction of the different uh, radiation beams. You have three in this uh, uh, scenario here. Then we do this uh, virtual uh, simulation process, measurement of the radiation dose were expected uh, uh, to go. And this is on the day of uh, delivery, the patients receive this uh, radiation from these different directions for this uh, kind of uh, example. And this is a gantry that rotate around the patient and deliver the, the radiation 
in the different uh, direction. Right. So one thing there is that they do make a mold of the patient that they reuse. So they'll stick that mold in so the patient's in the exact same orientation. That's one. And then they line up the tattoos at that point. So that um, you know that if it's a gonian metric, you know, it, you know, you know what you're aiming at. You've exactly. got to get the patient in the same place every time. And people are this is uh, actually being done as Brian uh, described and people are trying to use imaging as an alternative to doing that. So more imaging in, uh, uh, as an alternative to trying to position the patients using an uncomfortable type of uh, mold. Yeah, because it is discomfort, especially with patients that have tumors. A lot of this is used for palliative care. Shrink down the tumors, you know, get them from having pressure on various things. Right. Uh, you know, it, it cuts the pain quite a bit. How precisely can you aim? Very uh, yeah. sub sub millimeters. Yeah. You can go so sub millimeters. You actually, have to do it very precisely. Yeah. And one of these precise treatment is this one actually, uh, uh, radiotherapy for the lung cancer. This is called SPRT. I'll talk a little bit. It's a stereotactic radiotherapy technique. So this is uh, uh, for the lung in this case, and these are the multiple direction of the beam. And you have many directions in order to intensify the dose at the point of interest while trying to reduce it at the periphery around it. This, uh, this is, you know, uh, a transverse view, coronal view, and this is a sagittal view, and this is the virtual simulation process. So the machine, uh, you know, vary in their sophistication, uh, degrees of sophistication. So this is one example where they are trying to use X-ray for positioning. And this is uh, showing this is the X-ray coming from here, and this is a detector. And there are two ones at 45 uh, degrees in order to localize where the cancer is going to be. This is for brain. This is a brain kind of treatment, yes. Works well there. So uh, this is uh, another example. It's called the true beam. And it's a higher intensity radiation uh, uh, system. <coughs> and this is uh, one of the latest things in the market using a robotic type system, which can actually move in all kind of, uh, it has six degrees of freedom that is used for better targeting instead of just going through um, the central axis in this case. And there is other technology that being uh, uh, deployed for for the cert, uh, for the purpose primarily of localization and accurate localization where the cancer is. So uh, radiotherapy, like other fields, has its own dogma. In this case, it's going to be increasing tumor control probability, making sure you are controlling the cancer. We're not talking about a cure; it's control of cancer and trying to reduce the side effects, which is called the normal tissue complication probability. And the whole story of radiotherapy is practically, if you plot uh, uh, the probability of TCP, tumor control probability, versus radiation dose, or NTCP, which is normal tissue complication probability, versus uh, the dose, you would like to have these two curves separated from each other. You would like to have a higher probability of achieving uh, control of the tumor versus the toxicity that the patient is going to get. One optimization function you can use just multiplying the TCP minus one minus the NTCP and trying to make that maximum quantity. So that's the whole story. And this has been, you know, known since the uh, mid 30s by Holt Posen and others. One of the things about radiotherapy is that it has been a quantitative field in its beginning. And this is quite of an advantage over other oncology fields. But did it keep that momentum? This is kind of uh, part of the questions we have. Now, this is a series of articles that came, uh, came out uh, in the New York Times and, and other places as well that uh, radiotherapy can offer cures and also ways to do harm. So when mistakes happen in radiotherapy, it will make the news. And this actually was followed by uh, congressional hearings uh, on that topic. Now, this is an example for uh, a young person who got uh, treated and radiation hit the spinal cord in this case by mistake. And the result of that person who didn't actually had to suffer this uh, outcome that uh, he was paralyzed. But this is, there are okay, hundreds of thousands of fractions of radiation given almost on, on a weekly basis. So one mistake can make the news. And these are mistakes that can happen everywhere. This is an example happened in Canada for radiotherapy treatment errors. And this is a, a, an example that happened actually in France, actually recently, a few few months ago, and if you just want a quick translation of this, there are two uh, physicians and one physicist that were condemned here were, uh, you know, just locked up in, in jail for 18 months. That's what it means. Uh, just the French word is condemnation of that act. 
So it is a help. Love. Yeah, it is. That's four years of French. I mean, the French have a way of saying. Yeah, yeah. it's it's really funny the way it's said. Right? Yeah. If you do the direct translation. Um, so it's a double-edged sword. It's a double-edged sword, literally a double-edged sword, and probably many of you are familiar with the Fukushima story. So, so what's computational modeling? Uh, this is the definition from the NIBIB. The use of mathematics, physics, and computer science to study behavior of complex system by computer simulation. The objective is making prediction about what will happen in the real system that's being studied in response to a changing condition. So. Radiobiological uh, modeling, which we we're discussing, is no exception to that. It's pretty much using the um, uh, physics and biology and computer science to study behavior of tissue response to radiation. That's our focus here. <coughs> the objective is to make predictions. In this case, it's quantified as TCP and NTCP about what will happen in the patient that is being treated in response to changing radiation condition. Now, just, uh, you know, I know people here are familiar with this, but just for, to emphasize the point, computational modeling and statistics, they use similar tools, but they cannot be more different than each other. So in statistics, we make inference in the data with the objective of testing hypotheses, while in computational modeling is the process of generating hypotheses. You are trying to identify new ideas that you can test uh, later on, and they cannot be both more different than doing something like that. So uh, modeling objective, uh, this is familiar to you, it's a personalized treatment. Making the data uh, dreams come true. That was published in 2004. In this case, it's practically trying to identify which individual molecular profile, in the case of radiation, we're going to talk about a radiobiological profile, which would correlate with sensitivity or resistance to therapy. So one can think about it as just a psychic going through it, her crystal ball and trying to identify which patients are going to respond properly to radiation, which patients are not going to respond uh, uh, to radiation. And by the way, this is the average look in the field we have. So uh, precision medicine, probably you know more uh, about that. Um, Brian has been leading efforts on that. It's, it came uh, as a way to realize uh, this notion. And uh, particularly in the case of cancer, there is this uh, additional uh, effort, recent effort, probably he heard about that, this uh, moonshot to cure cancer. And there's a timetable on it. <laughs> but uh, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, data can help a lot in this process. <laughs> Data can help a lot in this uh, process, and definitely that contribution from all of us would, would make a difference. So again, uh, looking at radiobiological modeling as uh, response versus uh, dose, one of the things about uh, radiation, and this is a pretty biased uh, view, that it is one modality that you can easily uh, personalize for the patient. Because you can just change the level of radiation you are going to give. You can change the amount of fraction which is at each time point how much you are going to give and the way you are delivering that. That's not easy when you are doing, you know, uh, using chemical uh, 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 drugs. But it also has the same uh, side effects and risks that are associated with that. Looking at the classical paradigm of radiation injury, it's a practically interaction of high energy X-rays, uh, photon in this case, with the DNA. And this is what causes primarily damage. And once you have interaction with the DNA, you're going to get a single strand break, double strand break, then you go through different repair mechanisms. Some of them are complete, some of them are incomplete. You hope that tumor does not have this repair ability while uh, the normal tissue does, and you look at these differences between the two. So if you get incomplete repair, that leads, okay, cell death in the case of tumor for the normal tissue can lead to uh, detrimental uh, side effects in, in the form mainly in inflammatory uh, uh, responses. This could be late or could be happen early uh, during uh, uh, treatment. Now, also a side effect of uh, radiation is that it can, uh, it can be actually causes a, a mutation, whether these are uh, germline or somatic type of mutation, and this could also cause secondary cancers. And this is particularly important in the case of treating uh, children with uh, radiation. There are such, a, such associated risks. Right, so the origins of this go way back, even to, you know, uh... Max Jalbrook in the 30s, you know, uh, with the, the German experiments uh, that were done by Goodman. But um, 
uh, you know, Doctor, we should mention that uh, Dr. Neal, James B. Neal, uh, who founded the field of human genetics uh, here in Ann Arbor and founded our department, was uh, the he was the first physician really to walk into Hiroshima after the atomic blast and launched a 50-year longitudinal study on the effects of radiation just for the genetic. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, this idea of ionizing radiation, you know, um, damaging the DNA, back to Mueller and Delbrook and others in the 30s, the idea of ionizing radiation, its effects and mutation with uh, looking at genetics really starting in uh, 1946 with Dr. Neal and going on for 50 years in his 50-year longitudinal study. So there's a, you know, and then, a lot of and then, you know, and then what would be fun is that, you know, to have Dr. Neal here today and look at all these biological <laughs> cellular effects, apoptosis, he would love that. I mean, <laughs> friend of his. He, would, he would love to. Have Definitely, that. yeah. Well, I mean, the, the A-bone studies are ongo ongoing studies to study the effect of radiation, but um, these are much higher energy than what we're talking here, but that's also very, very interesting. Uh, this is a more modern view of uh, molecular effects of uh, radiation. So it's stopped by some sensors, transducers, and there are these effectors. The sensors are usually ATM, ATR uh, activation. And these are effects that go into the cell cycle. As you can see here, most of these are cell cycle kind of effects. And some of them are actually directed related to uh, a repair mechanism, G1, G2 uh, arrest, uh, stress response uh, gene. If we just take a look about the repair mechanisms, this is just looking at uh, two of these repair mechanisms, uh, non-homologous uh, joining and homologous uh, recombination. And there are many uh, groups, uh, labs, that study these different genes directly one by one. RAD51 is one of these uh, common genes. Uh, the XRCC1 uh, or XRCC family, which is the X-ray, actually, gene is also very well studied uh, in that uh, kind of uh, context. Now, uh, the omics world has, you know, this is the biology that we go from DNA to RNA to protein to uh, metabolites, and we have these different uh, kind of omics that we are talking about. And like every other field, we start by taking tissue samples, which are either from the blood or from the uh, tumor itself, and we bank uh, these uh, tissue samples, and we have uh, the outcomes on these. And they can go all kind of uh, omics analysis. Now, one can look at radiation response as a, actually a pan-omics. There are biomarkers, biological markers related to uh, uh, DNA damage and DNA repair. There are clinical factors, and there, is, uh, there are also these physical uh, factors. Imaging, because of the nature of the modality, plays an important role, whether it's anatomical imaging or functional imaging. So there is this word panomics actually specifically means the integration of physics, which is imaging in this case in the terms of radiomics, and biology, the different omics, proteomics, and genomics. Functional. Uh, what, what, what do I mean by functional imaging? Oh, okay. okay. So uh, functional imaging uh, implies uh, imaging modalities that allow you to look at physiological activity uh, in the body. One example of that is uh, positron emission tomography called PET imaging, where they inject a tracer. It's called uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, which is uh, an analog of uh, uh, glucose. So what happens, and we'll show some examples of that, what happens with tracer, that when you look at, at the cancer, it has a very high metabolic activity. So that's, uh, uh, you, you will see it uh, very highly. It's very powerful technique for cancer. Yeah. And there are other uh, functional imaging modalities looking at perfusion, <coughs> ventilation, using uh, MR or other uh, uh, radioisotope types. Anatomical is pretty much uh, uh, CT, CT like. There's this uh, issue when we are doing modeling with, uh, um, uh, with the omics that actually uh, the number of cancer cases, new cancer cases, is actually has not been changing over the years. It's almost uh, uh, plateaued. Also, the number of ca death cases uh, uh, is, is not changing. 
What is changing is the amount of information, the data we are able to gather, whether that's imaging information, which is increasing quite linearly in this case, in this showing here, while the um, biological information, at least this is looking at the nucleic acid uh, type of research, this nucleic acid research is going at an exponential direction. So we have more variables given the samples that we uh, have, and we need to figure out ways to deal uh, with this uh, P over N type of problem. One thought to do that in outcome modeling is to think about it as a top-down, bottom-up. So we start with this integrative, uh, integrated approach where we start by the clinical endpoints and look what are the variables that uh, could be related uh, to this. We're combining all kinds of information. Or we can go bottom-up, which is more or less mechanistic type approach on type of interaction that's happening and how we can build multi-scale type uh, models based on our understanding, physics, chemistry, and biology. It's a very important difference because, you know, you can phenotype from the bottom up, so top down, so you can stratify the patients and then you can use that to inform your mechanism studies. Absolutely. Probably where you're going. So this is like a bottom up. You start by the physical interaction. There is a chemical interaction, and there is a biological interaction. And this is the time scale and the spatial scale where these events take place. So radiation interaction or the physical interaction, the, the position of radiation happens in the femtoseconds on a nanoscale. Now we get some chemistry uh, effects here, primarily ionization excitations. This happens in the microsecond range. Then you get uh, the biology, which is you know, damage and repair. And this is the most complicated part of it that takes you know, large time scale, large spatial scale. And it's also multi-scale, as you all know here. It starts at the you know, cellular scale, uh, molecular scale, cellular scale, tissue and organ levels. And one looks at the cells, and the cells is a combination of heterogeneous uh, tumor uh, tissue kind, the whole combination of different um, heterogeneous type of cells. You have uh, the tumor cells, and the tumor cells could be divided into stem cells, a more differentiated type of cells. You have normal tissue, and you have infiltrated immune cells as well. So it's a more complex uh, uh, system. This is the integrated type of approach, which we try to combine all the information together. We come up with some models. We assume these models are a little bit noisy. We try to figure out what's our TCP and, and TCP as a function of these models. Then we turn on the crank, more information, we do feedback, and uh, we go through that. And this is what pretty much what I'm going to focus on for most of this uh, uh, talk. As an example of doing this, uh, this is uh, in lung cancer, Jamborea, which is, uh, comes from actually a title for a paper, uh, that it's uh, like a cocktail party where everybody talks and little people listen to what other people are saying, but still going on the conversation. And that's practically what we are doing here. We are collecting uh, all kind of information, imaging information, biological information, before treatment, during treatment, end of treatment, at different follow-up, three months and six months. So uh, imaging information, this is an example of a PET CT. And that's what I was talking about using uh, FTG. And you can see this is the uh, tumor from the PET uh, sitting on the background of the CT, which gives you the anatomy. And you can see that the tumor is actually glowing uh, relative to the background. These are uh, risk endpoints that happen due to radiation. One of them I'm talking extensively about is radiation inflammation. And this is what you are going to see seeing in the lung. So this patient got radiation to the lung, and you can see all these uh, effects. And in this case, you are seeing more effects, which is called fibrosis. So it's, it's like uh, when you get uh, you know, uh, injury, heat, for example, you get a burn, right? You get some inflammation at the beginning get recruitment of these inflammatory cells, then after a while you get a scar. Same thing happened inside the person in the lung. You get this inflammation, then you get uh, uh, the scar. Uh, but this could be deadly in this case because it's going to affect uh, breathing and might kill the patient as a side effect. Biomarkers, uh, any uh, type of biomarkers, we're going to talk about gene expression, protein expression, genetic uh, variation, this is a measurement of protein. Uh, expression using ELISA. This is, you know, uh, uh, gene expression PCRs. These are different techniques that we can apply to measure biomarker. 
So we're building so, uh, different uh, type of tools for uh, outcome modeling, particularly for radiation. So this is called the DREES dose response uh, estimation system that allow you to do analytical model based on a mechanistic understanding of radiation and data-driven model. The data-driven approach we divide here into two steps. So instead of doing uh, brute force search, we look at the model order using resampling techniques. This is cross uh, uh, validation, leave uh, one out, or using uh, information theory uh, uh, technique. Then we are doing bootstrapping in order to uh, uh, recognize which are the most predictive uh, uh, models depending on their frequency. For this case, we're looking at this radiation inflammation in the lung, you know, the maximum dose location of the tumor uh, in the lung can actually have uh, any effects and the amount of uh, radiation given to uh, a certain volume in the lung can have also uh, an effect. This is a multivariate analysis, uh, multi-institutional looking location of the lung and the average lung radiation dose MLD uh, effects have the main effect on, uh, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on patient getting this radiation inflammation response. Our physician like more visual uh, uh, ways to represent the model. So this is a normogram showing you uh, where the mean lung dose is, where the location in the lung, and what would be the predicted uh, uh, side effects. What's the predicted uh, NTCP? This is just moving into a machine learning technique which allow you to interrogate more complex relationships. The previous approach was using logistic regression. This is using one example is using these kernel-based uh, uh, methods, which in this case, if you have X's and O, you are separating them. Uh, they are non-linearly uh, uh, separated uh, in, the, uh, in the input space. If you map them to higher dimension, you can use this hyperplane to separate them because we know a lot about linear theory. This is one example of that is the support uh, vector machine uh, uh, classifier. And we have actually had... Um, opportunity to work with a large group, the different application of machine learning in radiotherapy, not only outcome, but other area related to uh, safety, related to uh, quality control, uh, quality assurance. So the learning principles that uh, we hope I all agree on, that the learner uh, cannot be better than the data. So the data is mm -hmm. actually a very important part. There is this uh, uh, garbage in, garbage out paradigm that you're familiar with. Uh, learners should be simple, but uh, not simple. That's the parsimony principle. They're solving the problem that need to be solved. Actually, this is from Captain Sparrow. It's a very important concept to keep in mind. And uh, learners translate the, uh, the data language. We need to avoid this black box. Uh, it's, we cannot get strong response from physician if they don't understand what's actually going on. That's a good slide. So talking about parsimony, Principles. Okay, learners should be simple, but uh, not simpler. This is said, you know, by Albert Einstein a long time ago, and actually it's part of the Occam's uh, razor. So when you are trying to build models, you increase the number of parameters, increase the model complexity, you are going to fit that model very well. Now you take that model, apply it on unseen data, start to measuring the variance, then you will see that the models that are more complex will have less ability to fit uh, the variance. Uh, this is what we do when we're doing training and testing approach, and we try to find this sweet stop. Uh, uh, spot between uh, the degree of complexity and the balance between uh, uh, bias and uh, variance. One way to do it is using this uh, uh, BC uh, dimension. This is an application for uh, kernel-based methods support vector machine to predicting uh, uh, radiation uh, pneumonitis. This is using a radial basis function. That's a Gaussian. So that's the width of the Gaussian we found. And this is people familiar with the support vector machine. There is this localization parameter between the fit and the separation that you need to uh, identify. And this is when you try to use it on these two uh, uh, variables, two space variables, which is mean lung dose again and uh, location of the tumor in the lung. The more inferior you are in the lung, the higher the risk that is going to happen. And this is, if you see that the relationship is actually nonlinear. So this is high risk patient. This is lower risk patient, and this is actually the uh, hyperplane, the classifier between uh, that separate the two. This green and red give you the margin. And if you look carefully, most of our points are actually using these two variables are in the margin. So when we're trying to make uh, a plot of the predicted probability risk versus the patient grouping uh, uh, risk, you can see low risk patients, all these models act the same. When you go to higher risk patients, which is what matters for us, that you can see that the support vector machine gives you a better prediction in this case. 
So it has a better, a good way to uh, separate high risk from low risk, but there is a large uh, uh, problem with the confidence interval that we are generating. So that, that made us think that there are missing variables. One way to identify missing variables, if you don't know exactly what are the variables, you go one of these ohmic techniques, and this is a proteomic technique in this case. So we took a, a very limited sample, longitudinal uh, sample, like I mentioned before, before, during, and after uh, therapy. Three who had uh, radiation pneumonitis, three who did not have radiation pneumonitis. You do a mass spec, then you put it against a certain uh, database. This is the result of this mass spec trying to identify the peptides. Then what we did, you know, because this becomes a, a very high ill-posed problem, the one way to solve it, we looked in the literature. Uh, based on that literature, we generated network uh, of interactions based on what's known information and use that as a regularizer. So pretty much using uh, optimization uh, techniques. And this is what we identified here. We identified this uh, protein called alpha-2 microglobulin as one of the, uh, the top hit. And then you have a list of other proteins. Now, uh, anybody familiar with biochemistry, you know alpha-2 microglobin is not a protein of interest. Nobody actually really studies that type of protein. And the reason for that, it's too big. It's uh, 725 kilodalta. But for our purposes, all the protein that has been implicated in radiation inflammation uh, in the lung actually interact with that big protein. So it's practically acting as a protease inhibitor. And so, you know, thinking about it from a mathematics, it's just, it's acting as a, you know, biomathematic uh, regressor. So it's just as good as it goes. Now we can test it using uh, uh, ELISA technique with looking at uh, protein expression for independent uh, uh, data set. And what you notice here is that patient who had high early uh, before treatment expression of this protein were uh, less likely to develop radiation inflammation. Another uh, uh, approach, uh, another interest in it is that patient, sorry, who had a very large change in this protein actually can be easily identified during therapy. Okay, so it acts as a radio protector and it acts as a biomarker. So it has a dual role despite the fact its biochemistry is not of great interest but still useful. Now, uh, what we try to do now is try to open that box. Like I mentioned, we'd like, we need to understand what's going on in the model. One way to do that is using Bayesian networks, very familiar to many of you. It's a generative uh, approach that try to relate variables in a, in a network type analysis. So in this case, the variables that we had are biomarker, the symmetric variables, clinical variables, all the combination of the pan omics. So this is interleukin uh, uh, six. This is the location in the lung, and this is actually heart dose uh, was identified a, a, as a variable. This is very interesting because you are radiating the heart and you are seeing inflammation uh, in the lung. So there is this interorgan also effect. This is more actually emphasized when we're looking at this um, enzyme. This is angiotensin co uh, converting enzyme which control hypertension, which is related to heart. Uh, 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 function. It has direct relationship with uh, radiation pneumonitis. And this is our uh, biomarker, the alpha-2 microglobulin is uh, related here. Now, the thickness of these lines represent the confidence level that we have in them. So the stronger the relationship, uh, the, uh, the higher the number, the stronger uh, the relationship. So this is showing different biophysical uh, interactions. Some of them we can explain, some of them we can't easily explain. And this is where the hypothesis generation process, and we'd like to understand these relationships better, like you know, the size of this, uh, the location and the relationship with the heart. Probably it has to do more of the movement of the lung. Now, we compared this uh, Bayesian approach with uh, logistic regression using also uh, the biomarker ACE and uh, the heart dose. And you can see it does perform uh, uh, relatively a little bit uh, better than the competing uh, approaches. Now, uh, in the world of uh, radiogenomics, there has been a lot of literature in uh, radiotherapy about the effects of um, single nucleotide polymorphism and whether they predict normal tissue toxicity. Now, the problem you are looking at a single nucleotide polymorphism, small changes in uh, protein uh, or gene expression, and you are expecting a large uh, effect. So many of these uh, studies actually uh, contradict each other. One thing we looked at is, uh, Alternatively, is looking at copy number variations. Using genetic maps that people have already reported multiple uh, SNPs in that region. 
turns out there is a copy number variation, which would have a more, uh, I mean, this is what we're talking about, uh, larger uh, uh, changes, whether it's deletion or insertion. One of these uh, uh, genes we looked at is that X-ray CC1 uh, uh, CMV. And if you look at the uh, NTCP, which is uh, uh, side effects versus radiation dose, this is another matter for uh, radiation dose. If you look at the symmetry alone, which is more commonly practiced, which is dose and volume effects, this is the amount of prediction that you are going to get. This is the amount of risk. Now, if you add this uh, uh, copy number variation for the patient to have that copy number variation, you can see that this risk actually doubled for radiation. So if these patients are going to get radiation in treatment, and they are not uh, genotyped for that gene, they are double the risk of the average person, which is what treatment is usually done on. And this is showing that the prediction actually complementary effect between that uh, copy number variation of XRCC1 and different dissymmetric variable, volume or the amount of radiation dose. If you visualize this relationship, you can see uh, using a uh, principal component analysis, you can see they are orthogonal actually to each other. These are the dissymmetry variable, and this is the genetic variation. You can see the genetic variation actually separate uh, uh, these population best, and also get further uh, separation using the dissymmetry. So most of the explanation of the data happening using uh, the genetic variation versus what's traditionally used is dissymmetric uh, variables. I've got a question. If they've got double the risk for some patients, do you have an alternative for them? Yes. I mean, well, well there are different kinds of therapy that could be given. Here we're talking about uh, photon therapy, right? And we're talking about uh, um, effects that happen in the rectum, practically. So you would need to avoid the rectum more or put them on anti-inflammatory type of drugs. Or you can use much more expensive treatment called the proton therapy if you are very high risk uh, patient. So there are alternatives. Instead of being treated like the average patient uh, in the population. Talking about uh, radiomics, so uh, practically this is the idea of using information from multimodality imaging, PET, CT, MRI, and related to biological and clinical endpoints. We're focusing more about the clinical endpoints. So in oncology, it is a decoding of the tumor phenotype with non-invasive imaging. So this is, uh, for example, our CT image. We can segment uh, the image. This is the location of the tumor. This is a lung, and this is the location of the tumor. Then you can extract features. Like we extract signatures and, you know, doing uh, genomics, we can also extract features from images. And these are, you know, histogram features, texture features, and different kind of features. And you can do all kinds of techniques, uh, supervised, unsupervised learning. This is an example of using a heat map, for example, for clustering. So, so this is, I just want to know what decoding was. So it's to get some molecular phenotypic information into the... Okay. Into the yeah. yeah. So you can use certain imaging to look at, uh, for example, hypoxia, metabolic activity, other kind of activity. But instead of just looking at the intensity, you can look more about what the images actually they are saying. Look at heterogeneity information. And this is actually, if you look just in the history of this, like describe the history of radiation is also 100 years old. The history of doing these kind of studies is actually another 100 years old. And it was started by a guy who liked to sell tires. Uh, he would have one look worth a thousand words, okay? And what they are looking at, these are the kind of tires they sell at this uh, in, in these days. And you are looking at textures, which is patterns that actually separate different type of tires for different uh, uh, type of seasons. And if you really want to know what's going on or want to understand the problem, so if you want, you know, know what's the tumor, no skin tumor gives you the answer. So image analysis requires some pre-processing, like we do uh, exactly with uh, uh, genetic or uh, protein data. So it's deep learning, try to remove uh, uh, motion artifacts, for example. It requires registration if we are doing multi uh, modality, and this is an example of registering two images, making the same reference uh, point, and also the segmentation, which is separating gray areas of interest from the rest of, uh, of the image. These are common radiomics features. Some of them are uh, simple des uh, descriptive, like we can look at maximum intensity, peak, in a, um, uh, peak uh, some other statistics like mean, standard deviation, um, coefficient of variation, uh, intensity volume histograms, 
looking at textures, which is, you know, patterns within uh, the image. And these patterns represent heterogeneity. That's what we're looking for. Heterogeneous tumor, non-heterogeneous tumor, what does it actually mean? And you can look also at the shape of the tumor. More elongated tumor, for example, in uh, sarcoma, have tendency to metastasize versus one that looks like a, a blob or a, a solid uh, circular tumor. And you can also look at kinetic uh, type parameters. This is from dynamic imaging. Look at metabolic rate, like we discussed, uh, or perfusion uh, uh, rate. This is a PET CT image in uh, lung cancer. So this is the CT image, and this is the PET. And you see the PET always glows in this image. So it pretty much gives you good localization, but it is a blurry image. It does not have good uh, spatial uh, resolution. This is a, a sagittal view, and this is a coronal uh, uh, view. So we extract feature like intensity volume histogram, which is pretty much how much uh, uh, intensity I have in per cubic uh, uh, centimeters. And I just am uh, moving along. So in the city, you use uh, Hounsfield unit. In PET, you use something called standard uptake value. This is a way to normalize uh, these images. And you can look at textures. Textures tells you about the heterogeneity. So in this case, PET shows you more heterogeneity uh, than CT, which is what you expect because PET is a functional image, while CT is anatomical uh, uh, type uh, uh, image. And the, the more this is spread, the more heterogeneity, the more heterogeneous the image is. Now, if you take these imaging features and you try to create a model, and this is an example taking a PET feature, which is uh, um, the intensity to 80% uh, um, of the intensity to certain volume, and the volume that has 70% uh, intensity, and try to fit it to the data, you get this kind of prediction, which actually fits the data uh, quite well compared to, for example, mechanistic model, looking at local failure. So patients who had this kind of uh, uh, image features, it's a heterogeneity feature, uh, saying that if I look at somebody's PET image and see that PET image is heterogeneous versus somebody who had a PET image that looks uh, solid, I expect that to be higher risk uh, uh, for failure. Now, we can relate this texture feature to uh, uh, biomarkers, and this is an uh, example doing it in fibrosis. And you can see that this entropy feature, for example, is, uh, show differences in the ACE uh, pre, uh, correlation between the two groups. This is a very small uh, study, but it gives you an indication that there is a relationship between the macroscopic imaging features and the microscopic uh, molecular uh, uh, changes that worth looking at. Just more into uh, the imaging and looking more into data reduction example in this case. So this is a PET MR cases. These are patients who develop sarcoma patients, which is a bone uh, type uh, uh, cancer. This type of cancer has a very high risk for metastasis. Uh, this is an example for a patient who didn't metastasize and a patient who actually did metastasize. And if you look on the imaging without being, you know, an image processing person per se, you can see there are differences between these uh, uh, set of images. Can you? This is important. If you could pull this off, this is a big thing. Yeah. So, because you could predict that from the images of sarcoma whether you get lumps. Exactly. And if you look at these images, you can see that these images has these holes in them. You look at this, you don't see that. Now, you, that's an observation, right? Yeah. So there is an association there, and it could be explained. Now, we didn't do that. What we did is a big fishing process. We extracted 10,000 features out of these images, OK? And the model came out to be, uh, this is on bootstrap, that, has, that is very well able to separate uh, patients who will develop metastasis from patients who won't develop metastasis with some uncertainty that you see here, OK? We'll talk about this uh, process. So. So it looks like you have a pretty big amount of data, but only you also extract a lot of features. Right. Did you guys ever try like unsupervised feature extraction? Because you know, if you look at the like MIKI conference a couple of past years, they use a lot of like convolutional neural nets and all the components. So you, you know, you don't have to define ten thousand features, so you can actually kind of scroll over the image and sort of try to pull out everything that is you know might be informative and discriminative or discriminative power yeah. to. This one is based on resampling and information theory, but you can uh, absolutely you can do composition in neural network. You can do random forest for uh, parameter extraction. But this one we wanted to uh, do it using resampling techniques, and uh, this one is actually based on bootstrapping. 
So uh, I don't have the formula here, but I can uh, show that to you. Uh, I can send you the paper if you are interested. Um, but again, we are dividing the problem into uh, two problems. One, one problem is finding the, what parameters we need, which is pretty much an information theory problem. If you have a very large number of parameters, this is the model you are interested in. How many of these parameters are relevant? Okay, you can measure that using mutual information techniques. One of these techniques published recently is called the maximum information technique. So that's what we're actually uh, using for this problem. That allow you to do not only with linear problem, but also with trends, nonlinear kind of association. For, for this particular problem, we have two types of scans. We've used the PET-MR, and we use separate PET-MR. Now, let's talk about information theory. If I separate the PET-MR images, I actually have more information. The, the counter argument to that, that you have limited learning capacity with the algorithm you are using. Here it's using a simple logistic regression. That's a very uh, simple model. It turns out that used information turns out to give you better uh, uh, area under the ROC curve, better in terms of sensitivity and specificity uh, as well. Because you are matching the amount of information to the learning capacity of the model that you are using. Maybe with support vector machine or more advanced neural networks, you can get uh, uh, better results. The principle, again, of parsimonious, what is the simplest model that we can use? In this case, there's four parameters. And these four parameters pretty much relate, all of them, related to identifying these zones in the texture model. So pretty much what we observe visually, if you do this data reduction uh, approach and you build your model, you end up with similar results. And these are the prediction. I mean, it's, uh, it's very high prediction. It's uh, 0.98 on bootstrap. But if you look at the uncertainty, that is generated from image processing, which is contouring in this case, that's 20% there. So it's about 80% to be safe. That's the prediction power that we have. Now, what do we do with this information? Now, if we are able to identify uh, which areas are more sensitive uh, uh, to treatment, which area higher risk for metastasis in this case, we can divide the tumor in this case, this is the sarcoma tumor, based on MR images, based on PET images, and based on here, looking at another tracer, it's hypoxia, which is looking at oxygenation level. Okay, so you can actually dose paint. You can, you have the technology to do that. It's just solving, you know, the prediction problem is the more important part for that. Now, uh, radiation doesn't stop on what I described. There are these uh, new technologies, which is one example I showed earlier, what's called stereotactic ablative radiotherapy, giving very high fraction of dose in a very shorter time. And the the reason we can do that now, because we have the imaging tools that allow you to confine the radiation to the regions uh, uh, that need to be targeted and avoid the high risk uh, uh, region. Another treatment is to use, like we did talk about, about the prostate uh, uh, cancer, Jeff asked, is that there is another type of particles, very expensive treatment, that uh, you can actually, this is the radiation dose as a function of depth. So photon X-ray keep going like this. While there are these particles like proton and heavier particle, they actually stop. They don't have exit. They don't exit. They just stop at the end point. So you can design a treatment like that. And there are also effects of radiation and also chemotherapy that people are looking at now, which is immune-mediated apostrophal effect. What does it mean? I uh, radiate this kind of tumor or subjected to any stress, what's going, it's going to express antigens. And these antigens, that would allow it to be identifiable uh, by your immune response, if you can help it, I mean, by blocking certain pathway, you know, the pd one and PD-L1, and there are trials uh, uh, to do that. And this is a very interesting uh, area in, in the field of uh, uh, oncology in general. Now, data is the cornerstone of modeling. I wanted to emphasize that. Wanted to emphasize, Data himself said that. And uh, we're actually trying to, uh, to edit this book, which is uh, in progress, which is main focus of this is listening to the data, developing approaches that uh, allow us to, uh, 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 to better listen to the data. And we look forward to anybody who would like actually to contribute to that, would appreciate that. Uh, make acknowledgments. There's a large uh, group of people that contributed to this work. I'd like to thank them all, uh, Washu and McGill, and Currently at uh, U of M, this is funding in the U.S. and 
from Canada of Lacus Acta students who actually did the work. <laughs> and I get to uh, present it. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. I appreciate the opportunity. Great talk. Oh, well, kind of you. Yeah. Talk about the principles that shows the integrated nature of how the molecular uh, work that we do is integrating into the larger translational applications. And uh, you know, and it also shows how physics and multiscale work. Yeah, it is absolutely it's really good. Thank you. Sure thing, please. With regard to emerging sciences, I know that there are research being done on this way of that they're using uh, gold nanoparticles sure. that were metabolized in the tumors, and that way they can actually yeah. uh, target the tumor with less intensity and still cause uh, reduce it, uh, reducible effects without uh, causing an increase in your NTCD. You yes. At well, uh, um, there's a lot of group looking at that, but uh, um, just to explain the principle behind that, that when you are using gold, which is a high Z material, high atomic number, you are going to increase photoelectric effects. Yeah. Photoelectric effects meaning that for a given amount of radiation, you are going to get double or triple that effect. But that also depends on the energy. For high energy, like we are using MEV, that effect is small. If you are talking about the brachytherapy type of treatment, or internal treatment that has a profound effect. So most of the therapy here we're doing in the mega voltage range, but there's a lot of interest in, in making this work uh, in the high energy field like it works in the lower energy field. Yeah. But that's a very important area of research. And people are decorating these uh, gold nanoparticles with all kinds of things. Yeah, the drugs, chemo, whatever, yeah. Chemotherapy didn't talk about that. It actually can act as a sensitizer some of them to radiation, which is the one that have uh, higher Z material that's, you know, uh, based on platinum, for example. So there is synergy between the different uh, uh, cancer treatment modalities. And the immune effects that happen after the tumor is irradiated is one, a one aspect. I mean, you show, showed a lot of cellular and molecular mechanisms, but, you know, there must be quite a uh, cascade of biological Activity that you know acts to clean up the mess, right? I mean, yes. You know, it's it's got to be an area of a lot of um, so original infiltration <coughs> and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's you know, there's, you know so it, we don't often ask the question of what occurs after the tumor, is right? Or or the tumor is um, treated with um, chemo. So uh, historically, this was observed in the seventies. A group in, uh, and the answers observe that effect. Now, the problem is that if you want to take advantage of that effect, you don't, it, it's a small effect, so you would like to magnify it. And the drugs or the pharma that was supporting that did not exist at, uh, at, that, uh, at that time. Because the effect is so small, could be observed in animal studies. I mean, that's what they actually did. And what, what's interesting about it, that they have a tumor at one side of uh, the mouse, tumor on the other side of the mouse, and they give a certain radiation amount of radiation dose. And they see that the tumor on the other side actually start to shrink. Although radiation is very localized, but there is some molecule, there is some cascade going on. Now, try to repeat that in a human where you have, you know, an immunosuppressed, uh, uh, most of these patients with cancer have that kind of effect. Uh, you don't see it as, as profound. But now with this uh, blocking of uh, the PDL1, PD1, or CTL4. New checkpoint inhibitors. A new check inhibitor starts. I'm getting ready to put my mother on one of those because she has that marker. And right. These are, this is the stuff that Jimmy Carter was treated with. Exactly. That's what he got in Atlanta. And yeah. a combination of radiation plus immune suppressor. And I mean, this idea existed for a while, but currently it makes its way to. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to talk to you about that because I'm looking, you know, it looks like what we want is so in lung cancer, the, if you have the immune, if, if you have those markers, then, you know, the standard of care now is that you would treat with the, the drugs uh, if the um, chemo failed. Cool. Now, if the chemo doesn't fail, then you have to negotiate. But the, 
the, the, the idea is that you want to have a combination therapy, not just the drug, but something else. And, right. you know, so it's interesting to be thinking about radiation as part of that scheme, you know, as opposed to another drug. Well, radiation is actually less systematic than chemo. I mean, chemo, you get this uh, very toxic material goes everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Radiation yeah, is yeah. very localized. Now, there is a pluses and minus for this idea of being localized. Yeah. Um, but that, this would be a very exciting work to do. We'll, yeah. we'll talk yeah. about that. That's good. So there's just a lot of um, possibility now. I mean, you know, it's a moonshot, but, you know, we are actually making progress in treating cancers, diagnosing them, treating them, and monitoring them. And this, this kind of approach has got to be fundamental to that. You know, it's highly integrated, and it's a data oriented. And we'll try to go both directions if we yeah, can. It's, 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 <laughs> so anybody it's, would like to contribute to that would one, be very happy. Yeah. If there's one principle to take away, uh, you know, that when we're working with the patients, we must do the top-down uh, study to allow for us to understand the actual human phenotypes that we're looking at. There's no way to just work from the bottom up as we would like to do in bioinformatics. I mean, it just won't work for the translational uh, approach. It's impossible. Just too many possibilities from the top down. So it's you have to more, really what you're doing is you're restricting. It's going problem. exactly. It's constraining the problem. Constraining your problem. So you can solve it. Actually, what's going to happen? You know, in our own case with the psychiatric pharmacogenomics, it would well characterize phenotypes where we fed the drug to the individual and see how they was. You know, and then you can pin them that way, and then you can define that with you know oh, uh, other methods. That's great. Uh, from the bottom up. Yeah. That's fantastic. Chris? Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Very informative.